Scripture lesson today is taken from Luke 23, 33 through 43. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with criminals, one on his right, one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed have been condemned, justly. If we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And no, we did not make a mistake by having this reading. This is a lectionary reading appropriate for this holiday today, which is Christ the King. Christ the King is the, as I announced at the beginning of the service, the last Sunday of Christian yearly calendar. And this reading was certainly picked for one main reason, to protect the church from triumphalism, to protect church from what I would call toxic divinity. Toxic divinity is a thing. Unfortunately, we are quite well aware, and in newspapers and elsewhere, we hear about toxic masculinity. But there is such a thing as toxic divinity. Abusive, dangerous, and even deadly. Let me be clear, toxic divinity is a human construct, a construct of a deity so often used and abused, the most easily it is like depicted uh, on how it is presented to children, and even some credulous adults. You rather behave because God sees it all and based upon your behavior God will reward you or punish you. If not immediately then certainly later and the latest at the last judgment by eternal life or eternal punishment. This is the toxic divinity an angry elderly judge, judge figure, with candy in one hand and a an switch in the other. You might say, this is just a caricature. Hardly anyone believes this any longer. Oh, you will be surprised. This concept, this construct of toxic divinity is alive and well among us and among many contemporaries. Mega churches and televangelists and prosperity gospel are all founded on this very principle of divine reward and punishment. And if not on divine reward or punishment, then on the metaphysical fear for salvation. 
We might not be those gullible, superstitious Christians, but we are still remaining under the spell of that toxic divinity. Just think about that it is even in our oldest confessions. It is deep within our faith saying, Father Almighty, a God who is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. Those are exactly common attributes of God in our t- even in our times, and let us be honest with ourselves, in our own minds and souls. Omnipresent, present all the time and everywhere. Omniscient, knowing and paying attention to everything and knowing sequences and consequences. Omnipotent, able to do absolutely anything. But behind this, and especially in its modern form, it is almost a definition of toxic divinity. And in its fullest form and shape, it is also a relatively recent thing, like two or three hundred years. So let us start with Father Almighty. Oh, here you have it. It's quintessentially abusive, patriarchal. Father Almighty shows us, or at least hints, the power and abuse. Father Almighty is, on the first part, I must say, not in the Bible. This phrase cannot be found in the Bible. It is hinted maybe once or twice, where these two words are put together in one sentence, but not as Father Almighty. The earliest is in Apostles' Creed and Nicene Creed and other faith statements. So it's later. And it, more importantly, originally did not speak about omnipotence, all-powerful, but about God as Pantocrator, it's from Greek, and it means all governing. That's a small distinction, you might say, but I think that in the theology always, small distinctions are quite important. There is a difference between all powerful and all ruling. But even that can be used and abused. But all those other attributes I mentioned, omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence, they are all present or hinted in the Bible, you might say, but never in its absolute format, in its pure philosophical form as it is so often believed. God is omnipresent until, as we hear, God is present just in the burning bush to Moses, for instance. God is, in the Bible, omniscient, knowing everything, until God needs to come down and investigate, like with Sodom and Gomorrah. God is omnipotent, stronger than hurricane, firestorm, or earthquake. But then we hear with Elijah, 
God is not in any of those events, but in voice of sheer silence. Those are just few Old Testament hints that God is beyond and above our philosophical categories and constructs. The story of crucifixion is a quintessential rejection of this toxic divinity. Christ the King, whose throne is the cross. Just think about it. Not ruling by vindictive, aggressive, abusive, arrogant power, but by the power of compassion, self-giving, and self-sacrifice. In a place of the omnipresence, God who is present everywhere, but with the nobodies, with the lonely, with the abandoned. In the place of the omniscience, God who knows all the depths of suffering and knows it not only intellectually, knows it by experience, in and on one's body. And in place of omnipotence, God Pantocrator, ruler of all, but different ruler of all, the one who rules by example, by ministry, by service, by love, by compassion, who does not want to force us into anything, but the one who wants us to be attracted. That is the Christ the King on the cross, fundamental, essential rejection of abusive, toxic divinity, any toxic and abusive rule. This is the Christ I heard calling me to ministry under totalitarian abusive, abusive regime of crumbling communism. And this is the Christ who is calling us to ministry in abusive capitalist society, undermining those distinctions of race, class, income, profit, numbers, showing us that there is something deeper and more important. God chose and chooses what is foolish in the world to shame lies. God chooses what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chooses what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are and build something different something deeper, more loving, more caring, that new kingdom, new rule of grace and love. This is the Christ we all, I hope, serve and believe. We reject toxic divinity and worship Christ the crucified king. And now be standing, join me in affirmation of faith, which is taken from the brief statement of faith of Presbyterian Church USA.
We trust in Jesus Christ, who proclaimed the reign of God by preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, by teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, by healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, by eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life because of sins of the world. God vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from the death to fullness of life. First of all, it was a very powerful sermon. Andrew, thank you very much. There is a, 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 a theologian, uh, Karl Barth, who's a very serious theologian, but he also said, thinking about the children's sermon, without joy, faith is nothing. And thank you for the joy for the children that we all shared, Andrew. <laughs>